Okay. For the first thing, um, you want to make sure that you always follow the checklist that we have included on the wiki, um, the fiscal year end checklist, instead of following what we have in the PowerPoint. So that way you, um, your districts don't miss anything. What we're going to be going through today is the pre closing. Um, we're going to be going through the NC1 payments. Um, also going over the USB Consters advance, um, the verify that, the make sure that it's clear before you start for the new fiscal year from the previous. Um, going over the STRS advance and projection. Um, also create new job calendars for the upcoming year if they haven't done so already. The MIS staff reporting um, for the year end cycle. And then also going through that starting to add new contracts uh, for any employees that start with the July 1st start date. For your NC1 payments, um, for those employees that are retiring as of June 30th, they wanna make sure that they enter in their NC1 amount um, when they're running um, their current or, or up the hill current or future um, before their last pay in June. So that way they don't, they can, um, don't have to do any manual changes because there is uh, quite a few steps for that. Um, again, I included the publication 15B and that's on our, on our wiki. So we all inc I included the website here or you can just go to our wiki and click on there. You guys hear it? Okay. Yeah. Now if you can just share your screen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Here. There we go. Okay. And we'll go to the next one. Um, here's a screenshot of the Epicale future or current that you would add. The NC1 is your um, pay type. You go ahead and enter a one, and then you can just enter in the amount that after you did the calculation, um, enter in the, the rate amount, and then you can also add a description of NC1 or excess of life. Um, for the NC1 payment, there is no taxes or federal, state, or OSDI that will be withheld. Um, it is added to the wages, but again, there is no tax withheld on that. Um, there is FICA and Medicare wage, or, um, taxes that are withheld on those wages. And again, if they have cities, um, they might wanna contact them. Maybe they already have those filled out on the dead name record um, if they tax the NC1 payment. And here is a screenshot of the dead name record. Um, you want to go ahead and enter a yes if it's if they tax the non-cash earnings. If they do not, then you just leave it as a no. But again, they would have to contact their cities, which most of them probably already have them set up. But again, if there's any new cities. Thank you. Thank you. There we go. Sorry about that. We muted that. Um, so yes, yeah, so they just might have to contact their their cities. Um, again, just a reminder, let the districts know that when they do add the NC1 amount, this is not included in the total gross that is paid to um, the charges on the USS side. So just to let them know. Um, if they wanna see um, any special totals for the balancing requirements, um, NC1 was shown the pay report on their pay sum and also they, it will show in their quarter report. Um, again, if they have quite a few, um, they can run a Safari spreadsheet, include the pay amounts view, and, and then this will include the NC1 pay types um, and from the selected date pay ranges that they enter. And again, um, they can make sure if they have questions, they can look on the employee's job screen three, and then this will show the NC1 payments that are added. For the USP, USP con screen, um, you want to make sure for your districts before they get started um, to make sure this screen is zero. So they want to make sure their, their advance mode is out. They have no amount left. And if they do, then they need to find out what that's coming from. So now once they have those all cleared, they can go ahead and start running their STRS advance. Um, they can execute this 
um, to start beginning um, balancing and verification of data. So they can start that as of now. Um, they wanna go ahead and select option one. And then this will give them um, projected days to the end of the fiscal year um, to determine the jobs to advance and then what their calculation of credit for the employee. Um, also, their earnings um, include those that are in the future that they have not been paid yet. So that does the calculation for them also. And then the advance amount um, will be too large um, on the USP con that screen until the June pays are completed. Um, job calendars for the next upcoming year, um, they can go ahead and start entering those as soon as uh, the board approves them for each district. Um, again, just a reminder under USP DAT, they can use the Cal maintenance option to enter these dates in. And then also they can use the copy function that can create one job calendar for the upcoming year, then use that one and copy them to the remainders. And then they might have to do some adjustments for the work days because um, if they different calendars work different days. For the MIS staff, um, you can go ahead and run clear attendance. And what this does is clear any long-term illness data that was entered for the prior fiscal 1920 um, school year. And then they wanna go ahead and enter the new long-term illness data on BioScreen for the upcoming 2020 school year, once that has been cleared for the previous year. Um, if the district has not already completed their EMAS ERM reporting cycle, um, again, the filing um, is gonna have to be done. They can go ahead and run the USPMS per debt um, go ahead and verify, make sure the staff data is correct for each employee. And then what this will do will create the sequential file for them. For the new contracts, the new contracts can be entered for those positions with the July 1st start date. So as soon as they get those, they can start entering those in and getting those ready. And then the contracts with other start dates can be entered um, once they have that information available to them. For your month end closing, um, you can go ahead and start, they can start running retire SERS reg. Um, they wanna verify the data using the projection first to make sure all the um, information is correct. They wanna make sure their total contributions should equal the total deductions and then any warrant checks that were payable to SERS. So they're going to do earnings times the 10%, and then this should equal the contributions. You want to go ahead and verify the service days for all the employees. Um, they can go ahead and run the actual option and say yes then to create the SERS tape once this is all verified. And then again, it creates their submission file for their last um, in June for, and it would be the SERS um, SEQ file. So they can go ahead and run the SERS email and then they can email that to themselves. And then they can go ahead and upload that submission file for the last month of the fiscal year. Um, then they can go ahead and run the SERS month and this clears the month to date totals from the Ford 100 and 590 and also the 690 record. And then once they run that service month and what it does, it also creates the ABS 101 report, the BIN report and the check status report. And it puts that all out there on the payroll CD pages. So they just wanna verify that those reports actually did go out to the payroll CD pages. Also for month end closing, you can go ahead and run the check status and the pay rec. And this can be used to reconcile checks. Um, you want to go ahead and run the check status to get a okay. list of the outstanding checks and then balance the pay, payroll account. And then also they can run the bin accrual for the last month um, if they do use that. For the quarter and closing, you can go ahead and run the quarter report and you wanna do the option of N first to generate um, a demand report. 
And this will go ahead and list all your quarter to date figures from the job screen and dead screen. This is where those get pulled from. Um, again, you wanna compare the totals of the deduction checks written to the quarter report to totals for each deduction code. And again, you wanna be cautious of any deductions that might've um, been combined by vendor number. And again, if there is any difference, you wanna go ahead and resolve that before closing. Also for quarter end closing, you wanna compare the total gross that is listed to any of the total of the payroll clearance checks that were written from USAS. So you wanna go ahead and subtract the gross for the payroll checks that were voided during the quarter from any payroll clearance checks that were written. And here's a screenshot of the total adjusted gross and the calculated adjusted gross where you would find that. So you wanna balance the adjusted gross on that quarter report then. So if the calculated adjusted gross equals the total adjusted gross, um, then it will list as zero, then you're good and you balance. Again, if there is any differences and you don't um, balance to zero, then these should be resolved. Um, here is a link um, that we included that will help you in determining maybe some balancing um, why you're off. Um, some of them you wanna make sure you verify non-cash amounts. Um, maybe verify the total annuities to equal total of all the deduction checks payable to the annuity companies. And again, auto report is always the best to use. Um, always look for any manual changes to the job screen, total gross, uh, any annuity amounts changes, and, and also to the federal taxable gross. Again, here's a screenshot of the quarter report, and this is what they will be looking for when you're balancing to make sure your difference in gross is zero. So then you can go ahead and start running W-2 proc. Um, you want to balance the W-2 report um, to minimize any problems that came into your end. So if they start running it now, they actually they can run it after every payroll if they like. Um, if that's helpful to make sure at um, calendar end, then they um, balance and they don't have a lot of time trying to figure out why they're off if they do it monthly or every after every payroll. Um, deductions totals for taxes and the totals for annuities. So they can go ahead and complete and balance a W-2 recognition sheet at this time. Um, they're going to want to run pay deduction, pay dead. Um, this generates a non-zero deduction report, so they're going to want to use the option A in the payment option field, and they're going to want to leave the cycle and the codes blank. Um, again, most of the time, your district should not have any outstanding deductions at quarter end, but if they do, um, they just want to look into these and, and why they're still um, showing. They're gonna to wanna to go ahead and run their ODGFS report at this time. They're gonna check all their totals and weeks for the employees to make sure they're correct. Um, again, once the data is correct, and then they can go ahead and run the ODGFS report again and saying yes to create the submission file. And just a reminder to your districts, um, the taxable amount listed on the report is used only for contributing employers. Calculated values based on the ODGF rules. So again, when they run the ODGFS report, they're gonna make sure they enter in their reporting quarter, make sure that is on, it says four. And again, the number of maximum weeks needs to be entered. So now for the fiscal year in closing. So after all your June pays for have been completed for the districts, um, if they're aware of any docs that might be um, for the summer months, um, they're gonna wanna go ahead and enter those now in the doc next pay field, which is located on their job screen for the employee. And then when they run the STRS advance, this will be included in that calculation. Um, if they're aware of any early contract payoffs, 
um, they're going to want to go ahead, they'll probably change the number of pays. And then just to have, remind them that their pay per period could change on that. So now they can run their STRS advance report. Um, they want to go ahead and select their option one. So what this does then is selects all the employees and jobs that were subject to the STRS withholding. So any employees that had any amount that they paid into STRS will be listed on this fiscal year report, which is the STRS advance dot report. Um, again, the service calc credit is also calculated based on the STRS decision tree. So if the district is STRS based on gross and the employees with STRS advanced jobs that have work days equal days worked, any amount remaining to pay greater than the zero, and then the pays greater than pays paid. So they will have, these employees will have an accrued contribution amount calculated for them. Um, the accrued amount will be the amount of the earnings not yet paid times the employer's STRS withholding rate. <clears throat> so the accrued contribution amount, this is calculated using the paper period from the job screen. And then for the remaining pays minus one. And then that's how it comes up with that last pay calculation. Here's a screenshot of that sample of the calculation. Um, it takes the obligation and the paper period. And then at the time when they run the STRS advance, the 26 could be out of 22, maybe 21. Um, and then it decides what their pay, the 23rd, 24th, 25th pay will be. And then also what the 26 remaining will be. For the STRS advanced sex report, um, what this lists is all employees with the accrued contribution calculation. And the report will be empty if the STRS is based on earnings. And again, it may be inflated if the fringe benefit flag on the 450 for the employee is set to yes. And again, the employee has a 691 with that inflated rate. Um, they want to go over this carefully and they can it should be consistent with the prior year so that they can always resort back to the prior to double check that. Um, again, they wanna make sure that they check their supplemental contracts for these employees because sometimes these can be missed. Um, then the non-advanced tax report, um, what this lists is the employees with jobs that should not be advancing. Um, if the job has no amounts remaining to pay, but they meet all the other criteria for STRS advance, and then if the days work plus remaining days from calendar year through June 30th exceed the total work days, should be on the non-advanced tax report. And sometimes it doesn't catch all the potential jobs and employees, so they just kind of want to verify that all the employees that are on there are correct and they shouldn't be advancing. So the STRS advance report, so once um, this is completed, the fiscal year end report for all STRS employees, including all advance employees. So this is just a total report showing all employees paid into STRS. So check reports for any warnings and errors. Again, we um, included the Wiki website here for you if you have any um, messages and what the possible solutions um, for those errors. So to verify the service credit, how that is determined, um, it's employees with 120 or more days that receive 100% credit. Any employees that have less than 110 days, um, they receive the credit that is based on the Esther's decision tree. Again, those employees that are um, part-time have a service credit based on the Esteris decision tree. So again, these employees are part-time flag on the 450 must be set as needed. 
And again, if they're uncertain if these employees should be part-time, they can always contact STRS and they can help you with those questions. So any re-employed retirees, um, again, they will always show zero credit um, reported with the contributions. So if you have employees that are showing zero, um, they just wanna double check maybe because they're marked as retirees. And again, um, the calculated service credit for retiree, retiree will flag a warning. So those um, employees will come up with a warning. Any staff retiring and rehired in the same fiscal year, um, again, they will always appear twice on the report. One will be with the contributions prior to the retirement, and then one will be for after the retirement contributions. For the SRS advance report, um, you want to balance the amount showing in the deposit pickup column um, that is on the report. And again, these should total the deduction checks that already were written to the STRS plus any warrant checks for the pickup amounts. So you can balance that by using those two. Um, again, if the district is out of balance and they can't resolve it at the districts, um, again, they can contact you at the ITC as needed. Um, again, they can contact STRS. Um, they usually can help them find the issue um, because the STRS um, balances by employee as well by the district. So again, um, if it can't be resort um, fixed at the ITC, Again, they can contact STRS. Um, once STRS advance information is correct, you want to run option two. And then what this does is finalizes the STRS for, for the fiscal year, sets the flag um, on the USP con screen. It also sets a closing date of the date it was ran. And then it places that total accrued contribution amount on the USP con. And then the district will also get an annual reporting submission file that needs to be sent to SIRS. And then what this does, it creates a temporary holding file for retirement reduction rates um, as they were in the, the dead screen um, when they run that option two and it's called saveadvance.idx. And again, the advanced field um, appears on the job screen, shows them that they are in advance for the employee. And then the advanced error adjustment fields appear on the estuary's deduction records. And again, this will create a payroll CD report for them. And again, if the districts um, want to print those final copies, um, they can, but again, they go out to payroll CD. Um, just a reminder to your districts, if they use a third-party data like Renhill, um, they don't want to go ahead and um, submit the Estrius um, advanced tape file yet, because um, you at the ITC will have to add those um, Ren Hill third party data to the tape file. So just a reminder um, to your districts to not submit that to STRS yet if they do have those third party. And then once that has been added, then they can run the answer send and then they can submit that file um, to STRS. And then once they do that, um, that will update that date of the time and who sent it to in the USP con. Also for fiscal year end closing, um, they're gonna wanna run the SIRS charge for SIRS. Um, this is the additional employer charge um, that is levied on the salaries for any em um, employees that are lower paid SIRS members. Um, the minimum annual compensation is determined by the systems so you have your minimum annual fiscal year, which is for 2020 is 23,000. And then this creates a worksheet that the districts will use for the SIRS surcharge calculation verification. And we also put in here that since with the COVID and everything, um, 
the SERS expects all the fiscal year 2020 surge charge payments to be made before fiscal year 22. So they're giving them, them some time, which begins on July 2021st. Um, and then if it's paid in that time frame, they will have no penalties or interest will be applied. Again, they can verify all this through the website that I included here. It shows all the complete details of that. Um, they're going to want to go ahead and run USP audit, and then this will create that USP submission file for the AOS for the auditors. Um, um, run audit report. Um, they want to choose the official option. Check the payroll CD, and they want to make sure that that is sitting out there and it got copied out properly before they move on. And then they can go ahead and run the fiscal file copy safe procedure, which is the USP fiscal copy. So when they run quarter report, they're gonna wanna select option F once they have all their quarter report, um, making sure that everything's correct, then they can go ahead and run that and it will zero out the quarter to date and fiscal to date totals. Again, if they have any um, mistakes and that needs to be corrected, um, two options. If the fiscal year has not been cleared yet, um, they can go ahead and the ITC, you with ITC can run um, the CMV advance. And what this does is inflect all the jobs for the advance. And then you with ITC will need to update the USP con screen for the SERS date and verify that the SERS advance flag and amounts are cleared on the USP con screen. And then the district can go in, correct those employees that were wrong, and then they can rerun that SERS advance option two. But if they have already cleared their fiscal year to date um, fields, then they're going to have to make those corrections through STIRS and contact them. And then they'll have to manually update and make those corrections on the employees 450, 591, 60, 691, if they have that, um, to reflect the contributions and gross amounts. So only the, those new earnings appear in the fiscal year to date fields for the upcoming year. And then if they really did a big oops, um, you at the ITC can restore their files and then they can start over if, if need be. Hopefully it doesn't resort to that. <clears throat> so now for your post-closing procedures, um, during your payroll processing, um, the fiscal year today amounts on the 450, 591 and 6991 deductions. Um, again, they, these will not be updated by any of those accrued earnings or contributions through the summer because fiscal year today will only show anything of the new fiscal year. Uh, the fiscal year, fiscal year today amounts on the job screens will be updated regardless. Um, the fiscal year today amounts on the 450, 591, and 691 deductions are updated only um, by the new earnings and contributions on those new earnings. So fiscal year today should only show the new earnings. Again, during your advance cycle for those um, summer pays, certain pay types um, districts cannot use on jobs when they have the advance flag set to. Um, one of them is reg and irregular. Um, certain pay types that may affect your balancing for USP con advance amount. Um, if they have any back payments for employees through the summer months, any BCK payments, back payments. Term payments, usually um, it might create a few cents difference. And then again, if they have any payoff for employees during the summer months, this could create a difference. Um, if they do have payoffs, um, the ITC uh, will have to go in and modify them, the pays and pays pays to be different by one. So that way when they run that next pay then for the employee that will force the contract to pay off. So again, um, just remind to their districts that then the USP con screen may not balance. So they may just want to keep track of any employees that maybe they're paying off during the summer months. So that way, when they do come to their last pay um, in the advance that they know why they're off. 
Um, verify each pay, the advance amount, um, again, is showing um, a decrease. So again, just remind your districts to always go back to that screen in USBCon and make sure that it's decreasing every pay. So again, then once all those summer pays have been completed, hopefully then the districts will show a zero in that USPCon field amount. Again, if they're not zero, they can always run that check stirs and then they can compare to, um, employee totals to see whose amount withheld on the accrued earnings did not equal the amount stirs advanced. So that is very helpful. So just remind them they do have that report. And then once they do figure out what that um, amount that they were off, they'll have to file those corrections with STRS as needed. Um, for the fiscal year 2020 EMS staff reporting, um, again, um, the L staff course submission window for EMS reporting, um, if it's extended beyond the June 30th, um, the procedures as follows below that we have listed, what they will have to do so they can create a um, file. Um, they wanna run the USPMX and what this does then creates a file, a sequential file. Um, also, if your district reports contract employees, then an additional file will be created with the underscore EMISR. Again, then the district will want to send you at the e, um, ITC an email to inform them that they have created that file. And then they will go ahead and you will archive the file, naming it, renaming it to the USPMX fiscal year 21. Um, again, you at the ITC should send a message to this district stating that it has been archived, processed, and has been completed, and that their file um, should can be emailed to themselves. And again, if you guys, uh, somebody at the ITC is responsible for loading the staff data, um, you will want to upload this file then to EMIS SIF or e email that file to your EMIS coordinator. Um, a checklist, checklist of these procedures and more instructions regarding these changes um, can be found in our wiki documentation. Um, it's the ITC USB EMIS checklist and then also the ITC EMIS fiscal year end staff updates. And again, I just included that website for you, but again, it's on our wiki under the classic fiscal year documentation. Um, again, just a reminder for any new employees, maybe at your ATC, that just the part-time employees, um, STIRS started that calculation a little differently on July 1st of 2019. And so I um, included that decision tree for the part-time employees um, website and also the service credit guidelines brochure. And I included... Um, a screenshot of just how those part-time employees um, are calculated here. So um, they can review that um, if they have employees that are not balancing for part-time and this is how that is determined. And then also another screenshot um, just showing um, if your days worked are greater than 90 or less than 90 um, days in employment relationship and if the salary is greater than the state minimum of how they get those, <clears throat> get their calculation for those part-time employees. Okay, is there any question on the classic fiscal year in review? Um, again, not a, um, any changes that have come um, set for the 2019 for the part-time employees. Okay, um, I think, Michelle, do we wanna take a five minute break for you to get ready for your? Yeah, why don't we just take a little bit of a break here, Andrew? Okay, you're good to go. All right, well, good morning, everybody. Um, this morning, I'm gonna be covering the classic USAS 
presentation um, with our fiscal year end checklist. And I'm also gonna cover our EIS uh, classic closing. Um, so you know, please feel free to um, it, you know, ask any questions uh, that you need to regarding this. Really nothing's changed. So not a whole lot of difference compared to uh, last year. And this is the second to the last time that we have to do these classic <laughs> presentations. So one more year and uh, we're done with these. Um, so we're getting close. Um, and here is our uh, links to the documentation. And so this is just showing you, you know, everything is available obviously underneath our meetings and training page. So you'll see the fiscal year end information right here, 2021. And so we've included PowerPoints and the checklists that are already out there. And those are generic checklists. So you guys, you know, have been customizing those for years, um, but uh, nothing's really changed on the uh, USAS one or the uh, classic uh, EIS. You know, we made changes last year on EIS due to uh, no longer having to report inventory to uh, period H, uh, but this year that's still status quo. Uh, there's uh, no requirements to report inventory to uh, period H reporting. Um, so really no major changes in the checklist. So the following steps here uh, must be completed prior to closing the fiscal year end in the classic systems. And I know we have some new people um, that are, you know, on uh, board at the ITC. So again, any questions that you guys have regarding this, just feel free um, to ask away. So the first thing is under the USA EMS DB, um, this is the district's uh, general information and building information. So this must be entered through the USA EMS DB program. So this is going to be included on the financial reporting for, uh, for period H. And so um, to enter the information, you're gonna be running options one and two, and you can also run option three to do a building report. Well, let's talk about those. So the first one is the central office square footage. And um, so it, if obviously that hasn't changed from last year, that information will probably still be in there from last year. And also the ITC's IRN is um, the second field. So that's your IRN for your ITC. Um, so that should be entered in there for the dist for each of your districts. The transportation and lunchroom percentages and square footage are found in option two. So again, if this information's in there from last year, um, if there have been any changes made, then you can reference this uh, and go ahead and enter those changes in here. So it should automatically bring up the building that are located on the district, their IRN numbers. And so any changes in the transportation and lunchroom percentages um, can be entered in here. So nothing different than what we've had in prior years. There's also a report that can be ran um, for transportation and lunchroom percentages. So this is something that can be run ahead of time if you wanted to look at you know, what was out there already um, from last year um, and taking a look at this information. Um, so that's all it is, is just a report. Um, and those are the only three options that need to be run. I know there's a fourth option in there that isn't relevant anymore underneath USA EMS DB. So you're just basically working with options one through three in that program. Uh, the next one is Val Act. And uh, this should be run to check for any invalid accounts that may need to be fixed prior to closing for the fiscal year. I'm trying to recall if we made any changes to fund function or object codes this year. And I don't believe we have. Uh, we've had some new funds come in um, regarding, I think, uh, the COVID funds, but um, I don't think any, any changes um, that have been made. Um, but um, they should be definitely running this to make sure that they don't have any fatals. Um, a fatal message on a bail act will prevent the USA EMS files from being created. And those are needed in order to import those into the data collector. 
Um, so you definitely need to make sure that they run this ahead of time and make any necessary changes. So what they're going to see is they're going to see warning messages and they're gonna see possibly fatal messages. So the warning messages aren't going to include, aren't going to cause any problems or prevent USA EMS um, to run, um, but fatals will. So um, you just, they just kind of want to scan through there. And when they do run the report down at the bottom of the run, it's going to tell them if there were any fatal messages encountered. So if so, then they need to review that report and make any changes. So if there is an invalid function code or invalid object code, they would need to run a count change then and change it to the correct code. So here's a screenshot of ValAct. And so it's just basically showing um, uh, the options here. So, you know, you're basically going to choose R. And then from there, um, would you like to exclude accounts with all zero amounts? Choosing yes will exclude those ones from the report. So that's significantly going to reduce the number of warnings on your report. Um, so that's their preference on how they want to handle that. Um, so like I said, um, um, right here too, I wanna make note of this to move my slide from over here. Um, accounts which have um, dollar amount fields that are all zeros will have their errors listed, will be listed as warnings. So if there are any amount fields that are non-zero, then those will be considered as fatals on the report. So like it's always worked. Um, so just you know, one, one thing to keep in mind. Um, one thing that we always make note of um, every year, and that's in regards to, and it's been a change that occurred several years ago, but we always make note of this special warning is uh, ODE requires the OPU to be entered for certain function and object codes per the EMIS guide. Um, and so this is something that they'll also see as a warning is, a, I guess, a, probably a critical error, which is pretty much a warning in the data collector is that um, there are some function object code pairings where the OPU building IRN is required um, is basically what that means. So if there is a warning that is issued in VAL Act, and it is just a warning, it's not a fatal, um, it's going to issue it if the IRN related to that OPU is the district-wide IRN. So what it's saying is, you know, you have this function code of 4111 and an object of 891. Well, according to the EMIS guide, section 6.3, it's saying any 4100, which this would be part of, and any eight, and then there's an X here standing 880, 890. So that would fall underneath this object that function object code pairing must have an OPU, meaning a building IRN number. Um, so it's, that's the recommendation and it's been out there forever. Well, several years ago, the data collector um, started posting these critical messages saying, hey, you need to take a look at these. And like I said, they aren't fatals. They're just, hey, you need to take a look at these because if these are, you know, supposed to be changed to a specific building IRN, then, you know, you can make those changes in account change. Um, and so this example down here, you'll notice that the um, 400 is showing um, with an IRN of the district-wide IRN. So that's why they're getting the warning because it's thinking that you know this should be a building IRN. Well, maybe this is something that is spread out district wide and it's not pertaining to a specific building. And so the treasurer wants to leave things as is, that's fine. But you know, that's what that warning's for, just to say if you do want to change this, you can by going into account change and making the change. But if not, you can leave a go and it's gonna prorate it throughout the district. Um, so that's basically what that, that means. They can leave it or if they feel like, you know, this particular account should really be 
part of the high school IRN, then they could go into account change and change that from a 400 to a 200. So it's, you know, it's been like this for several years now, but uh, we do get questions about this. So I just wanted to um, uh, go over it again this year. EMIS fund categories. Um, so VALAC does list these as well. If there is an invalid fund category, um, there is an EMIS FCAT report that lists all the funds and their associated fund categories. So, um, and you'll you see a screenshot of that. Um, so if there is a missing one for a fund that should have a fund category, they're going to get an ear on the VAL Act and they just simply go into that account and add that EMIS fund category. Now, I can't tell you if these are still being checked um, regarding ODE. I have not never received any confirmation that um, these are um, still valid. Um, or, um, or if there have been changes made, the data in the ODE manual has been the same for several years. Section 6.2 of ODE's EMIS manual lists the cash records um, with these EMIS fund categories. And I have not seen any changes to these um, for several years. So I know in redesign, um, you know, there's not any checks with that as well. So, um, but obviously, if Val Act is still checking this. So if there is an error that's generated in Val Act for the fund categories, those have to be changed in order for USA EMS to run. Operational units, you just want to check out the operational units um, to make sure that um, everything looks good and that they're valid and there haven't been any changes. And so um, you can look them up via uh, the OPUs in UCAS Web or through OPU Edit in the VMS site. Appropriations, they can start entering their next year proposed amounts via the APROP program. So we do have these IAB or these um, NYP options that they can use right now, and they do have to be careful. They have to use the NYP options now, they cannot use the IAB options the IAB options um, would change their current year amounts. And uh, I'm sure they don't wanna be doing that. They wanna be doing their estimates for the, for the new year. Um, so if they wanna go and get ahead of that and enter that stuff in, they can. So let me, um, I have a screenshot of those, yep. So in here, you see those next year proposed amounts. There's an NYP INI, which clears out anything that's currently existing in the next year proposed amounts. So if they aren't sure if they accidentally put something in there and they just wanna clear it out and you know wipe the clean slate, then they can go in and run that INI option. Um, so that will go out there and clear out everything that's currently in the next year proposed. Um, there's an option in there that they can go in and select a wildcard and an asterisk and it will clear everything out. Now the NYP mass allows them to enter in a range of accounts to be mass up, updated based on their calculation. So if they want it to be 100% of last year's expendable amounts, um, then they can put in 100%, they can put in a percentage. And again, it gives them options to do ranges of accounts or wildcards. Um, so that's the way to quick mass update whereas the NYP mate allows them to enter them in individually. So it gives them a little bit more control of going in, they can put in a range of accounts and then it will pop up a screen showing all of each of the accounts with a line that they can enter in the next year proposed amount. And they can go in and enter those in individually and use page down to advance to the next screen and enter them all in. Um, so that's another way of doing it. Um, the third option is NYP load. So they're taking a spreadsheet, um, like an Excel spreadsheet and loading it in uh, using the load option. So again, all of those will only affect the next year proposed amounts um, fields on um, the budget screens and the revenue screens. So um, then those will be set. So when they close and run adjust for fiscal year end, it will take those amounts from the next year proposed 
and load them into the initial budget amounts for the new year. So those are some of those preliminary things that can be done ahead of time. Um, going back to the budgets here, if they don't use the NYP options ahead of time, that's fine. Um, once they close out for the fiscal year and they're in uh, July, then they can use these IAB options to enter in that information. So um, any questions regarding um, the month end, or I'm sorry, the uh, preliminary steps? Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and move forward with month end. All right, so for month end here, um, and nothing's changed, they're gonna go ahead and enter in all their transactions for June, uh, make sure that everything's in there before they close out, and they're gonna perform the reconciliation procedures to reconcile with the bank, uh, the, meaning they also wanna run bell check to make sure that everything's in place. Bell check's going out there and looking at the account information and making sure the time periods, month, fiscal, calendar, and the types of accounts, cash, um, of your uh, budgeting and your revenue, everything is matching and agreeing. And it also looks at the encumbrance amounts on the accounts and compares that with what's on the transactions and making sure that those are okay. So any errors that are on the bell check are gonna show off to the right-hand side and it's going to say the word error. So those shouldn't be ignored, especially at, at uh, fiscal year end time. So those should be cleaned up. So if they um, do call and say, hey, I'm getting an error in my bell check. And if it's just the encumbrances um, line on the bell check, fixed encumbrance may take care of that. Um, but if there are errors on any of the others, then that's something that um, needs to be looked into. And if you guys have questions with it, you can always create a classic support ticket and we can help you with that. So the current encumbrances on the bell check should balance with the PO detail report. So we have steps to you know, make sure that those agree. The cash reconciliation from USA EMS ADT should balance with the fin sum. So um, that's one of the steps there with month end, running your cash rec and that amount that's entered in should always agree with the fin sum amounts. So your fin sum and fin debt need to balance. So those are stored amounts. So, you know, we have to think classic, everything's stored. We're redesigned, everything's calculated on the fly. So in classic, you know, the fin sum amounts are stored amounts. The fin detail, your transaction amounts, those are stored amounts. So if something happened and there was a hiccup, something didn't get updated properly, it's going to get caught when you run fin sum versus fin debt. Um, so those, I'm sure districts are running this all the time, um, but they, they want to ensure as part of their month and closing to always run these two and make sure that they balance. Um, when you run the fin sum, there's an option to run the fin debt at the same time. And then at the end, there's an output showing the amount total current fund balance on the fin debt versus the current fund balance on the fin sum, those should agree. If they say that they are not balanced then something happened and that's something that um, you need to look into with the district. Um, but yes, those should definitely be balancing. Um, the SM2 calc is the next step and this is optional. It's tracking their SM2 amounts. So um, they can run the report to make sure that everything looks good. If it doesn't get run, that's okay because it is part of the monthly adjust. So when you run month and adjust, it runs SM2 calc automatically. Um, but if they wanna do it ahead of time, they can by uh, doing this optional step. Generate any month end reports desired. So these are the minimum reports and all of these reports are on monthly CD. So um, they wanna make sure that they run monthly CD for June as well. And this will go out there and create all those month end reports. And that's it for um, the month end. Any questions regarding month end? Fiscal year end, we'll get started on those steps. And um, what they're gonna do is make sure they complete the rest of the USA EMS EDT options 
they performed the cash rec option during month end. So that's option one of USA EMS EDT. Now they need to fill the rest of these and these are only done at fiscal year end. So if they don't have inf any information to enter into them, like the civil proceedings one, if they don't have any active um, cases, um, court cases, then they're at least going to go in and, and enter into the program and exit out. There's a flag that gets set in USA EMS EDT to ensure that that option was at least um, accessed. So you just wanna make sure that they go in and go back out just to set that flag. Um, each of the options in USA EMS does have the ability to generate a report. So those things can be um, run ahead of time if they want to, to see you know, what was out there from last year. Um, but uh, those, are, um, those options are available. So here's the main menu of USA EMS EDT. And like I said, the cash rep was part of the month end closing. So that was already taken care of, but you have these three other options. You have a federal assistance summary, federal assistance detail, and a civil proceedings. So, um, and then that flag thing I was talking about where it sets the flag, that option six is something that you see, but your districts do not. And that's a change flag that allows you to go in and set flags if you needed to. Um, but they will be filling out two, three, and four now. That's part of the fiscal year end steps. So again, here is option one, cash rec. So they've probably already done this, entering in um, their bank balances, deposits and transit, any outstanding check amounts and any adjusting entries are done in this option. And then it does produce a cash rec.txt file. And that does get included in on the CDs, on a monthly CD. So, and here's where I was talking about in cash rec at the end of the run, it is going to show you an ending balance and a fund balance. So the ending balance is the amount that they entered in on the uh, option and the fund balance is coming from the system that's automatically calculated. So that's what's on the account file. Those should match and obviously they don't in here. Um, so it's definitely going to display those and then they have to figure out what's happened. And usually it's some type of thing they mistyped um, transpose numbers in um, when they're actually entering in the information in the cash rec. So they just wanna make sure that those balance. The federal assistance summary um, is marked to show whether uh, their total federal expenditures were, or were more or less than $750,000. So um, it's just marking that, making them put in uh, the year. Um, and information, so no different than what they've done in prior years. Uh, the federal assistance detail, um, in classic we have this initialization option, um, which is pretty nice because what that does is it goes out there and deletes the prior year information. So right now, if they go in here, it may still contain 2020s information. Well, they wanna clear that out and go in and recalculate. Now it's only going to do it for 500 funds. So it's gonna go out there and it's gonna delete whatever was sitting out there from last year and go out there and look at the expenditures and receipts for the, those 500 funds and put them and recalculate them and place the new amounts um, in here. So with that being said, um, if they have um, accounts outside of the 500, those need to be manually updated or entered um, if they don't have one out there. So they just make, need to make sure that initialization doesn't cover all funds. It just does the 500s. So if they have maybe an 006 fund, they need to go in and modify that one and update the amount to report 21's information. Um, also with the initialization, it does clear out the CFDA numbers. I know that's probably not a you know, one thing that I, I don't like about this. Um, so that's why one, running a report of the federal detail ahead of time before they go in and run the initialize um, may help because it that report contains all those CFDA numbers. So if they do run the initialize option, they can go back in. They already have that report with all the information. 
and they can go in and re-enter those CFDA numbers. So that's just one caveat of this is that they have to re-enter those. So um, suggested uh, source documents, there is um, information out there on OED's website about um, these amounts and things. So um, they can reference that or what they have received from um, the state regarding their federal monies. So here's just an example of what the federal detail um, record stores or what it contains. Here's the CFDA number, the grant title, the fund and special cost center, what was received and what was expended. So those are the things where if they use that initialize option, it'll recalculate these and place the current year's amounts in here. But again, they can go in and update these manually too. The fourth option here is civil proceedings. And so, um, and these are if they have any existing court cases. So if they don't have anything, like I said, they have to at least go in and enter the information and then exit back out. But uh, if they do have it, then it prompts them for the information and they're putting in, if this is something with a, a case that's run over for um, you know, multiple years, then they need to enter in the total expense and then the fiscal year expense information on here. Okay, um, just to kind of, I know, cause we're all so focused on redesign and how that's working, but just a refresher of how it works in classic when it comes to financial reporting. So data is reported to ODE via EMSR, has been for several years now, and the reporting period is period H. And what it's going to pull is it's going to pull cash budget and revenue net amounts for that fiscal 21, um, OPUs, the data that's entered in USA EMS EDT, and the data that's entered in USA EMS DB. When you think about that, the USA EMS DB was that building profile information we talked about as a preliminary step. USA EMS EDT is what we just finished reviewing, your um, federal assistance detail, civil proceedings, and your cash rec information. OPU code, so it's gonna pull that from your OPUs. And then the cash budget and revenue account amounts. So the SIF's going to be pulling that information um, in as well as the OPUs. The other two, USA EMS EDT and the USA EMS DB is coming from the flat file. So we'll talk about that here a little bit more. So um, when USA EMS is run, that's the next step, um, it's going to go out there and extract the USA EMS EDT and the USA EMS DB, and it's going to put it out there in a flat file layout that is then going to get loaded into EMS R. So when it does that, it's going to go out there and check that all necessary funds are coded with the valid EMS fund category. Um, it's also going to go out there and um, it's going to produce warnings or fatals. So a warning message is going to be issued if the cash rec is not in balance or contains errors. And it's also going to um, provide uh, warning messages issued if any of the options are not complete. So they really want to pay attention when the USA EMS runs to make sure that everything looks good. Um, they will get fatal messages if the federal assistance detail record does not contain those CFDA numbers. So that is a fatal. It needs to have those on there. And it also looks at the federal assistance summary record to make sure that it's the current fiscal year. Um, so they'll get a fatal if it's a different year. So what happens is um, the end result of the USA EMS is it creates two files. So this is a real important part is that there is a USA EMS um, R sequential file and there is a USA EMS .seq file. So the underscore EMS R file is what they're going to load into EMS R. That's the flat file information. That is this stuff right here, USA EMS EDT and the USA EMS DB. So they're gonna take that and upload that into the data collector into period H. And then when the data collector runs, 
it's when it runs the collection, it's going to pull in that flat file information and it's going to go out there and via the SIF and pull the account information from the system. So um, the USA EMS.seq file is the full file. So that contains the, these options here, plus it also contains all the account information. So they will not be using this to load into EMSR. So they are going to be pulling just the flat file and loading that in. Um, so the only time that this is used is for loading ITC specific data. All your districts will not be um, using this full file. They'll be using the partial file. So it's been that way for years. So none of that has changed. <clears throat> So just to review again what the partial output file includes, it includes your USA EMS EDT, which is cash rec, federal assistance summary and detail, and your civil proceedings. And it includes the USA EMS DB information, district and profile information. It will not include account and operational unit records. That's getting pulled from the SIP. So um, these will be uploaded and again, using the SIF to get the full collection when you're ready to collect that data in EMSR. So, and here it does go into a little more detail about what SIF does. It pulls cash, expenditure, revenue account information. So, and it's smart enough to know um, whether it's pulling the current year or the account history. And so that um, is, so, you know, if they're running this in, you know, July, and doing their collection or even into August, the collection period H ends August 31st, um, it'll know to go in and look at the account history information to pull 21's data, even though they're in fiscal year 22 in their live files. So the SIF will, will take care of that based off that date. It'll know that I need to be pulling 2021's information in. Um, and also it pulls, like I said, the operational units too. So everything else outside of cat out of the accounts and operational units is getting pulled from that flat file. So again, just a reminder that they should be uploading the partial file. And when they're collecting the data, they're going to select the financial data source um, along with using the step in order to pull pull the account information. This is a screenshot of USA EMS. So you'll see here where it, first thing it asks is, are you extracting for an ITC? So if you are doing specific data for an ITC, just doing their data, then you would say yes to this. So if you're running it, you know, if you're in charge of running it for your ITC, um, and you say yes to this, then it's going to prompt you for the accounts, the cash accounts that you want to include. Um, otherwise, what it's going to do for districts is they are not going to um, say yes to that option. They're going to use the default of no, and then it goes through the rest of these prompts. So it's going to you know, ask for the fiscal year, and it should default to 2021. Um, and then you'll see the two layouts. We've got the USA EMS full file and the USA EMS underscore EMSR. Like I said, that partial one is the one that they're gonna upload into the data collector. Any questions about USA EMS? I'm not seeing my chat, so I'm, I'm having trouble seeing the chat window here. I think once I get out of my PowerPoint, I'll be able to see it and I can answer any questions there. But if you have anything right now, please go ahead and unmute and let me know. Okay, the next step is USAS Odd. And so um, I've got a screenshot of what USAS Odd looks like. So it's going to take this information and send it to the Auditor State's um, office. So again, making sure you have the right year in there, the right date selection, and then um, there's an option to send to AOS now. So if they wanna do like a test run first and take a look at this information if they want to, um, they can say no to that and um, it'll generate the output files. It does create text files and SEQ files. So um, 
if they wanted to review that for some reason, maybe the fin sum that gets generated from that and just make sure that the amounts, the totals look good. Um, they can do a preliminary run here and say no to sending it to AOS just to confirm that the fin sum is correct. And if everything looks good, they can you know, run it again, making sure to say yes um, to send data to AOS now. And also um, they can send that data to additional email addresses. So if they wanted to send it to an auditor or an accountant, um, they can put that address in here and it will be sent to them as well. But you'll see what it's basically doing. It's extracting account, vendor, check and receipt data for auditing purposes. So it's creating these sequential files for the account information, for the vendor information, for the transaction, the check and receipt information, and a thin sum. And it's also producing these uh, text files too of the same thing. So, um, so that's all that gets generated during that program run. They should also generate any fiscal year and reports. So if there are specific ones that they want to run at this time, they can. Otherwise, fiscal CD um, should be generated, and that's going to generate a standard set of fiscal year end reports, and all of those are outlined in the documentation. And so that's going to be placed on that monthly CD website. So when you look at monthly CD, you have a link for every month, and then you'll have a link for the fiscal year. So obviously, it's going to create full fiscal year. So it's going to run a fin debt and date ranges are going to be from July through June. So it's going to have the entire year on that. Same as some of those other activity reports like FUDLED and RevLED and stuff. They're all for the full year. Um, we recommend making a copy of the USAS files to archive. So um, you, know, you might have an archived directory somewhere. Um, so we recommend archiving a copy of the files before they close out. So put those somewhere. So those are specific to the ITC. Um, obviously we have no new files added um, so, um, for this year. So um, if you have any questions about your copy procedure or you're new and you're not quite sure how you guys run that, um, or you want a copy of you know, what we have available, um, let us know. So, but um, it should be no different than what you guys have done in the past. So adjust is the last step. So you're basically running adjust for the month to close out June 1st. And then you're running adjust again for the fiscal year to close out the fiscal year end. So a lot happens during that process. Um, so once adjust runs for fiscal year end, the districts are in July processing and they can start, or in July, and they can start processing for the new year. So this is kind of what's happening behind the scenes when you run adjust. So for the accounts, um, it's gonna move those amounts um, to the USA HIST file. It's gonna record those amounts for fiscal year 21 in there. Um, the current fund balances are going to move to the July 1st cash balances for those cash accounts. So whatever you know the 001 general fund fund balance was at the end of 21, that's going to become the beginning balance for the new year. Um, the future year encumbered amounts are now moved to the future encumbered amounts. Um, and then obviously the future year amounts are going to be zero. Same thing with requisitions. Your next year proposed are going to be moved to the initial budget revenue field. So when I was talking about a probe and setting those next year proposed amounts, they can do that now. It's stored in the next year proposed field, but once they're, they close out at the end of June um, for the fiscal year, those amounts then get moved into those initial budget, initial revenue, and it updates the initial amounts and the gap original amounts. Those get updated as well at that time. The current encumbrances um, from 20 are, 21 are going to be moved to the carryover encumbered amounts for 22. Your fiscal to date amounts are cleared. So once you run adjust for fiscal year end, you run a bud sum right afterwards, there's going to be zeros on the fiscal year to date columns because you've cleared everything out for the new year. Calculated amounts fields are all recalculated, and your gap original amounts are set to the new expendable receivable amounts. So 
lots of stuff happening during fiscal year end. So it's really important um, that they follow your, you know, your procedures to the T to make sure that there aren't any hiccups while they're closing out. Also with adjust, your vendor information gets cleared out. So those fiscal year to date amounts for vendors all get reduced uh, down to zero, those get cleared out. And then in USA Con, when you take a look at that screen, um, before you close out for the year and you go into USA Con, every month's gonna have a two because it changes from zero, meaning the month's open to two when you close, when you run month end adjust. So all of those months are gonna show two before you close out. Once you um, clear it, once you run adjust for fiscal year end, those all go back to zero. So you're gonna see a bunch of zeros now in those. Um, and the current fiscal year obviously is going to be uh, um, updated. So it used to say 2021, now it's going to say 2022. So again, these are just reminders um, that districts should be uploading the partial file and not the full file for their district data. Um, and like I said, when a district's ready to run their collection in EMSR, they're gonna select the SIF agent, which will pull the account and OPU information and the financial data source, which is where their flat file information's at. Um, there is an EMIS reporting year flag out there in USA Con. So when you're looking in USA Con, you see you know, all the months with the zeros, you see the fiscal year date, uh, which says 2022. And there's also, which now says 2022, there's also an EMIS reporting year that's still going to show 2021. And so that's what tells SIF where to pull the account information from. So, you know, I'm in August and I decide, or at the end of July, and I decide to run my SIF collection, um, it's going to go out there and say, okay, I'm in fiscal year 22, you know, in USAS, but my EMIS reporting year is 2021. So when the SIF pulls that information, it'll look at the accounts, but it'll go, wait a minute, I don't want 22's information, I want 21. And it's gonna go into that history information in USA HIS and pull the 21 amounts. So it is smart enough based off of that EMIS reporting year that's in USA Con. And for that reason too, we do strongly recommend districts hold off making any updates, account change and fund change specifically, or deleting any accounts um, from last year um, in fiscal year 22 until after EMSR reporting is done. And that's the end of August. And the reason why is when SIF runs, it goes out there and first looks at the live files and says, oh, here's the account. And then it goes in and based off that EMIS reporting year, looks to see, oh, but I need to go in and look at the history information for that account. Look, look for 21's information. If you go in and make changes before the end of the reporting period, so if you go in and do an account change, it's the SIF's gonna look and that account is no longer gonna be there. It's now a new account. So it's that information is not gonna get reported and which really did occur in fiscal year 21. So that's why you wanna hold off making any changes, account and fund change changes until after you know, the reporting period is done. So like I said, that'll be end of August. There is no supplemental period again, just like there wasn't last year because they aren't requiring capital asset reporting. So, um, so that's just a note that we've had for several years now is just to hold off until that stuff um, is complete and they have submitted everything. If they've submitted everything, everything's come back from ODE, everything looks great. And it's, you know, beginning of August and they're like, do I really have to wait because I've gotten everything back from ODE? My, basically my period age stuff is done. Um, if they wanna move on and start doing account change, they can, but um, until they get all that information back from ODE, the reporting information, you know, just hold off and making any of those changes until that stuff's done. 
Uh, I hope I have the right reporting or draft schedule here. Um, I think I do. Yes, I do. It says 2021. Um, so this is the data collection calendars. And again, if you're kind of new to this, um, all you have to do is go onto ODE's website and type in EMIS uh, data calendar and do a search and it'll bring up the data collection calendars. And so here it's just underneath, you know, it's got all of the staff student, you know, collection periods. And there's one for financial, there's a section for financial and you'll see the financial collection it states when it opens and when it closes. So just to point out that the closing date is August 31st. Like I said, we used to have a supplemental period available, but they took that away um, when they um, removed the requirements for capital assets. So there is no supplemental period anymore. End all be all date for financial reporting is August 31st. Um, and then the rest of this information pertains to five-year forecast. So um, ITCs, if, and this is in regards to um, those that report for their ITC. So they would submit that full file. And when you run USA EMS, it is, you know, will ask you what specific funds you want to include. And when you do that, so if you put in like the 025 funds, I believe it is the ITC funds, it's going in whatever other specific funds that are just specific to that ITC, then what it's going to do then is it's going to create this full file then, and that full file can then be uploaded into the data collector. Um, so if your ITC has a fiscal agent, um, then again, um, one thing that can be done is you know running it specifically for the ITC and selecting those accounts. Another thing um, that if that's not going to work is being able to pull that file into EMIS FFE, making the changes in there just to reflect the ITC's information and then pulling that into the data collector. So that's another option. Um, what you guys have been doing in the past for your ITC specific information, you keep doing it, nothing's changed. But if you're unsure of, you know, and have questions about it, please create a classic support ticket and we can help you with that. Post-closing procedures. Again, this is just a reminder that EMSR has always been under district control and not ITC control. And, and uh, so that specific person um, at the district, whether it's the EMS coordinator or the treasurer, will be uploading the flat, flat file running the data collection and submitting their period H data to ODE. So again, must all be sent before the August 31st deadline. And again, capital assets are no longer included. Another post-closing step is USA EXP's GAP EXP. Um, so in order to pull their information into WebGAP, they have to create the file for it. And so the GAP EXP, there's a screenshot here that shows you uh, what they need to do. So they're basically, and they can do this in their live files. They don't need to be in an archived period in order to run this because it asks for, it prompts for this um, specific fiscal year. So they can do this in their live files, which if they're in 22 already, that's fine. And so what it's gonna do then is they're going to put in the accountant or whoever's in charge of this and send that gap exp.txt file to that specific person. It's going to contain their 21 data, and then that person can take it and upload it into WebGAP. And these are just some links regarding GAP. Any questions regarding those fiscal year end steps? Like I said, hey, I'll yes. Oh. Hey, Michelle, this is Carrie. And maybe I was not understanding correctly, but I think it was back on slide 37 um, when you run adjust for the fiscal year and some of those things that are happening. Yes. Um, it said the future year encumbered amount moves to the future encumbered. Could it also just move to the encumbered amount? Um, Is it kind of like split out between the two fields? 
it will know right based okay. off of correct off of what it you know what those amounts are if they're july or if it's a future other future months so you're correct it will yeah okay thanks for clarifying i just thought maybe i was misreading into that but nope. thank you anyone else all right these are just some um, notes about um, what we did over this past year in Classic, which wasn't much. <laughs> there wasn't much to do. Um, the only thing we've done since the last time we met um, at Classic or at Calendar Year End um, since then is we did do a uh, OOPS update uh, with uh, TR 1099. Um, so we did that back in July or in July, in January. Uh, what was happening is that um, the net totals um, were being um, displayed incorrectly on the report, on the TR 1099 report. The tape submission file was fine, but that report was showing it incorrectly. So we made an update back in January to get that fixed. Um, so that's really only the major OOPS release that we've done since December. Um, one thing that I wanted to talk about with you guys is we do have, and I think it's been brought up at um, maybe touch base or maybe steering committee prioritization meetings, is some fund type changes that are going on. And I just got off a call this morning with AOS regarding these changes, and I attached the JIRA issue with this. And um, they're still waiting um, from ODE, word from ODE regarding when these changes should be um, in place. So we're not 100% sure yet when changes will be made, but according to AOS for now, what their plan is, is that there are going to be some renaming of the uh, description of a fund for custodial funds. They're gonna be um, being, being changed. So the, uh, O22 and the O26 uh, funds are going to um, change those. Um, so the agency is, is becoming a custodial fund. Um, so those are going to, I believe, take place um, now um, with at the end of, before the end of the fiscal year. And one thing that we weren't 100% sure about yet, and that's what we're still waiting um, from AOS once they hear word from OEE is the 200 funds. Um, so the fund type is being changed from an agency fund to a special revenue fund. Um, and so obviously there's a bunch of 200 funds that um, your the, the districts have. Um, one question we had about that is if we change them now, what happens with um, fiscal year end reporting the data collector. Um, so should we wait until after reporting is done in order to make those changes? Uh, because we weren't sure, you know, right now if we make those changes, those agency funds are going to show special revenue um, for fiscal year 21. And so is that a big deal? We just, we don't know at this point. So that's what we're still trying to find out. And so what AOS has decided, um, and like I said, they're still waiting for ODE's approval on it, is to hold off and make these 200 fund changes in September um, after the reporting's done. And so there will be an oops patch going out to make those and make all of those um, 200 funds a special revenue. So, so this first option is just renaming the fund um, and it's making those agency funds custodial for the 22 and the 26. So that's not changing anything other than the description, but the 200 funds is a whole new different type. It's changing it from an agency to a special revenue. So that's a bigger change. Um, so that's where, you know, they stand right now is they're going to hold off and do those in September. So right now, when it comes to classic, you know, that USAS V644 JIRA issue right now is planned before the end of the fiscal year to change the fund description on these two funds. But when it comes to the 200 funds, it sounds like it's going to wait, they're going to wait till December and we'll have 
probably an oops patch go out then to make those changes. Um, so, and again, with redesign, it's going to be the same thing. We're going to be making those changes to these two funds, their description changes, I think on the 618 uh, release, and then the 200 funds are planned to be changed then in September. So if that does change and you know they hear word from ODE that they're okay with changing them now, um, then maybe we'll, we'll change this again. But for right now, this is where it stands. So 22, 26 will be changed soon within the next month. And the uh, 200s will be put off until period H closes. Okay. I'm gonna stop sharing. Hi, Michelle. This is yes. Melissa. Can I ask you a quick question? Sure. It's sort of along the lines of that 200 activity fund. Um, about a month or so ago, uh, I had a treasurer put a ticket in. Now she's on the redesign, but it doesn't matter in this, what I'm gonna ask here. She has a private gap accountant, accountant um, do her, obviously her gap. And she was told that she was gonna have to change some 200s, if not all her 200s to 300 accounts. Has anybody heard anything about that? Cause I asked, um, you know, from coming from a district, I, I got to be friendly with some gap uh, state gap, gap auditors and auditors, and I asked them, and none of them had heard anything about this, but yet this private gap auditor is telling her um, that she's going to have to be changing some 200s to 300s. Has anybody had heard anything about that? Have you heard anything about that? I have not heard anything about changing some 200s to 300s. Has anyone else heard anything about that? Yeah, because well, for her, it becomes a problem because being on the redesign, they don't have fun changes. Right. You know, exactly. so her her problem was because there's not a fun change, if they want it changed prior to the close out of this fiscal year, it becomes a, a very big task because she can't just do a fund change like classic. She's going to have to literally do expense distributions, create those funds, do expense distributions, get board approved transfer for the funds. You know what I mean? Like it's a lot of work. And um, I told her, I emailed her and let her know, hey, listen, I talked to some of our state auditors locally and even a gap auditor and that gap auditor didn't even, hadn't even heard of it. So I, I told her, I, to, since it's private, to uh, maybe ask her group audit, you know, state auditors from her area. So I just wanted to put it out there to see if anybody else had heard anything about it. And, you know, and we have been in communication with um, the Outer States Office. Like I said, we just got the phone with them this morning and we we're reviewing some things and they did not bring up anything about changing any 200s to 300 funds. So. We will send her an email and see you know, our AOS contact and see um, if she's heard anything about this. Um, but no, I, we have not, SSTT has not, not that I'm aware of, we've heard anything about this. I would truly appreciate you, you doing that for me. So, cause I like, again, I don't want her to make, have her do all this work and it wasn't necessary. Right, exactly. You know, yeah, so. that's, yeah, that's, um, yeah, I, I, yeah. This is the first time I've heard that. So yeah, I will. And I'll send out an email message to you guys okay. um, and let you know for sure. Um, I, I, tr I truly appreciate that. Yep, no problem. It, this is this is Deb at so, And when I was a treasurer, uh, it's probably been about 10 years ago now, I had an auditor come in and I don't, know, I don't think it was private. It's, it might've been private at the time actually. And they were telling me there was a couple 200 funds that they thought should be 300 of maybe it was 300 that should be 200 and it was to me it was their interpretation of was it a district managed or a student managed account it was their interpretation of it I think one of them I went ahead and changed and one of them I said no nope, that's not how it works and so it might be something like that with that private um, CPA firm too good to know did they say which specific ones they wanted changed no she didn't give me any specifics just that she had to change 200s to um 300s and i i kind of understand what they were saying because you know 200s are your student 
activity funds, you know, they're managed by students, but technically they're not if you have a teacher who oversees it. They're kind of right. more district managed. Yeah. And I understand that, but I, I can't get, other than what she's telling me, her private uh, gap auditor's telling her, I can't confirm that anywhere. Uh -huh. So um, I just wanted to throw that out there to see if anybody else, you know, had heard anything. Yeah, and I'm, I'm sure, you know, based on what you just said, Deb, I bet I get the same kind of response from the auditor's office too, just saying, you know, it depends on on, on how it's being used and stuff like that. So it just makes me wonder, yep. yeah. Yeah, and I think each district can be different because you could have a yearbook maybe that is district or is student managed, or you could have it that it's a district managed one. So wherever they set it up originally, that's, you right. know, where it goes. Athletics right. is generally not student managed. So for sure, those are 300. But yeah, I, I think it's something they could probably argue that they think it's in the right area and be okay. Right, right, exactly. But you know, uh, um, Melissa, I'll be sure to, you know, just send something just to confirm that. And I'll let you know. It, I appreciate it. Thanks so much. I got my chat pulled up. I don't see any other questions. So you guys have any anything else regarding USAS or fiscal year end, second to the last time we do this for classic? Nope. All we right. said the same thing for calendar year end. We only have one more to go. <laughs> Yay. Yay. I hate doing two books. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to move over to the EIS. We'll just keep rolling here because that's probably not going to take very long. Um, unless we get into some conversations about uh, the migration of uh, redesign, which I do want to talk about um, specifically. So let me get this uh, PowerPoint up here. <clears throat> All right, get this going. Okay. And so again, uh, when it comes to inventory here, everything again is underneath our uh, SSTD meetings and training page. So we just have a PowerPoint and um, a checklist for uh, EIS. And so with inventory, um, with classic, they should be finishing all their current year processing. Um, so, you know, they need to, if they haven't and they're kind of behind, they need to catch up, um, especially with the migration um, going to be the redesign inventory happening here later this summer. Um, they want to make sure that they get caught up on their inventory. I know that they may have um, kind of put things off because of the no longer requirement for period H reporting, um, but you know they still need to get their information in for other types of um, things that they're um, sending to people regarding their inventory. So um, they want to make sure that they get caught up and that you know they get their current year processing finished, and then any items um, received on or prior to June um, should be added um, in 2021. Anything received after that is going to be added in 22. So any depreciation data that's been changed on several items, I would advise that they run EIS DPR and get that stuff fixed. Um, the one thing with EIS DPR is that um, it does affect all items. They can't select a specific tag number um, to run depreciation for. Um, so it's gonna be an all or nothing thing. And if they have items where they've had several acquisitions posted along the way, um, so they may have five or six acquisition transactions against that item throughout you know, the past couple of years or something like that, Running EIS to UPR is basically going to, the calculation is going to basically lose their depreciation history. And so what that means is that, you know, it's going to say, okay, I had this item, I added this item three years ago, and I have made six acquisition transactions to update the original cost since then. And 
with that, you know, my depreciation, I'm tracking depreciation on this item, you know, my depreciation has changed every year because of these changes in the original cost. You know, I've upgraded that and added to that. So my depreciation kind of changes every year because of that. Well, if I go in now and run EIS DPR, it's going to say, oh, your original cost, you know, is $10,000. Well, I'm going to take it from your very beginning date, which was three years ago and just calculate depreciation from you know three years ago and just make it an even depreciation amount every year. So that true depreciation history gets lost. I mean, gets erased and it's just going from whatever the EIS DEPR calculation is. So, and that's something if they're not sure, you know, or if they're inquiring, you know, should I be careful about that? Um, then they need to contact their auditor about it and find out for sure if they should be running EIS DPR, you know, for those. But I'm not sure how often that happens that they're adding additional acquisitions onto existing items. But, um, you know, EIS DPR will lose that true depreciation history when it gets run. Um, one thing they want to check at year end is making sure that districts that have a dollar and life limit in debt screen, um, they want to make sure that their assets are meeting both um, capitalization criteria. So we do have a little procedure here where they can run a 304 report and follow these steps to ensure that all items um, are being capitalized correctly if they have both a dollar and a limit. Um, most of the time when I've dealt with um, inventory, it's usually just a dollar limit and not a life limit. Um, but you know that's one thing that they need to be aware of. They have both just to ensure that everything's getting tracked correctly. When everything has been added for the fiscal year, the district can run the recommended reports. Um, so um, all of those recommended reports are, are going to be explained in the upcoming slides, but the EISCD um, will generate most of these reports. So they definitely should be running EICD to get all the information they need for um, fiscal year end for inventory. So the 101 and the 102 reports, and I'm gonna throw in some stuff that's happening with redesign. So you kind of know where we're at when it comes to inventory um, and just kind of give you a comparison. Um, so in EIS gap uh, reports, we've got the 101 and the 102. Uh, we do have those already out there and we're testing those and redesign. So they aren't going to be called 101 and 102. They're going to be called by their given name, schedule of fixed assets by source and schedule of fixed assets by function and class. Um, so those are, we do have the gap reports in place in the migration. Um, but in here in classic, you know, the schedule of fixed assets by source is basically where this came from, what purchase order um, did this uh, capitalized asset come from? So it's the source. So what fund was the item, um, what fund was used when the item was originally purchased? What was the PO information? So it's basically all the acquisition transaction information is on the 101 report. The 102 is just a schedule of fixed assets by um, the function and by the class. So there are different ways that you can generate this report. And we've got those same type of options available in redesign as well. Um, this report is gonna create a summary and a detail. And um, so there's a 102S and a 102D. So this report shows the book value. So that's your original cost minus your depreciation so far, the life to date total. Um, to equal the book value. So that's what the 102 report. And remember, these EIS gap reports, 101, 102, 103, 104, are just your capitalized information. It is not going to include non-capitalized. The 103 is your schedule of changes in fixed assets. So this is showing you what's happened throughout the year based on how you run the report, whether you run it by fund, function, I'm sorry, fund, asset class, or function. 
Um, so um, there is a summary report that's just a nice um, summarized report of this was, if I'm going to run this report by asset class, this was my beginning amount. This is what was um, acquired during the year. This is what was disposed of. These are any transfer transactions I get. I did any error adjustments to give me my ending balance. Um, so the 103D, the detail makes up the tags or, or provides the tags that make up those amounts. And then the 103E is an error report. Um, and that's going to show any odd changes, um, you know, and that's more like stored data information. So we really, and, you know, causing a, a problem with uh, creating an error in Classic, we won't have to worry about that from what I understand in redesign because these aren't stored. It's getting, it, you know, those amounts are getting calculated on the fly. So I don't think we're gonna have to worry so much about a, an air report and redesign. Um, the gap flag in here must be set to yes in order to generate these reports. So in that screen, there is a EIS gap flag. And so that has to be set to yes in order for these reports to even generate. So um, I know just from history, auditors have always wanted the reports to run different ways as a class one in function. So they can be run that way or they can let the EIS CD take care of it because it will run it all separate you know, ways. So, and then we do have an entity ID that can be included or excluded. So that is something to in place with uh, redesign that they can um, include or exclude entity IDs. So this is an example of the 103 summary. Sorry, that's a little blurry. Um, but it shows the beginning balances, you know, and this is run by asset class, you know, what was acquired this year, what was disposed of, any transfer transactions I did, any adjustments that were done. Um, and that means that you set that error adjustment flag to yes. Um, and that can be on an acquisition, a disposition or a transfer transaction. Um, to equal the ending balance. So the auditors are, you know, are watchful about beginning and ending balances from year to year. So they're making sure that the ending balance from a prior year matches the beginning balance for the current year. So um, these things have to you know, be um, looked at and made sure that everything looks good. The totals on the 101, 102, and 103 should match. Um, those should match. So the totals on those reports um, all should agree with one another when they're closing out for the year. So if there is a 103 air report, it shouldn't be ignored. So um, we need to look into that as to why uh, they received one. And so um, we do have documentation out there regarding that. We do have videos out there on YouTube that explains those and with steps and how to correct them. So the 103 reports the original cost amounts. The 104 is the depreciation amount. So this is the schedule of changes in depreciation. And again, it's got the summary and detail reports as well. And they can sort it by you know, asset class fund and function. Um, and so again, it's going to give the summary, you know, that change information from beginning to end where the detail is gonna provide the tags that make up those amounts. And so same type of stipulations down here. And so the, the EISCD will run them all three different ways. And this is a screenshot of what the 104 looks like. So the beginning depreciation continuing items. So this is what's being depreciated the current fiscal year. So that it's the fiscal year depreciation amount basically. Um, acquisitions, dispositions, transfers, and adjustments to give the ending amount. And again, those are things that the auditors will look at, making sure ending depreciation balances with the new year's uh, beginning amount. So those are the gap reports. And in the redesign, we do have those four reports created. So um, we're in the process of testing them and, and all of that, but we do have those four reports out there. Uh, the non-GAAP reports, um, I'm going to talk about some of these, run through these quickly. 
Um, regarding uh, the inventory redesign, uh, these aren't available yet. So those are the things that they're working on right now to get these. And I think these are going to be considered template reports. I'm not sure. Some of them might turn into can might have to be canned reports. I don't know yet. Um, so, um, but yeah, so those are things that are still um, they're still working on and, and getting um, taken care of right now and running through that. Um, the 303 is the master listing. So I don't ever recommend printing this thing out. It's got all of the different screens of item screen and acquisition and everything in one report. So it's the master listing. Um, this is part of EISCD. So leave EISCD to run that report, um, but uh, it is, it's just got all the details about what's on that item and everything regarding that item. The brief asset listing, the 304, is our most popular report. And I think this is one that's run most often. Because it's a summary report, it's easy to read. It's got one line with each item on it um, showing, you know, this is the tag, this is the description, this is the original cost, this is the location, the category, you know, you know, so it's it's pretty easy to read. Um, we have it in EISCD to run it five different ways. So we've got the brief asset by fund function and asset class. And then we also have two separate uh, 304 reports where it's just gonna include the acquisitions that were created during the current year and the dispositions that were created during the current year. The 305 is the book value report, the depreciation report. So this should agree, um, if you're running this for just capitalized assets, it should match your 104 report. Um, so those should be in agreement. Um, so this displays all the depreciation information, listing the original cost, if you do have salvage values, the book value, the percent that's been depreciated so far in that item, and the last year of useful life. So that's all on this report. And again, this one's included in EIS CD as well, and we've got it run four different ways. So the 401 is the insurance values report. If they are you know, tracking those insurance values um, in CAT screen, then they can create a 401 report of that information. Um, it is recommended that districts maintain their replacement costs and insurable values um, on their inventory items. So um, that's something that they can currently in classic extract that stuff out and have an appraisal company update them and they can import them in, or they can run a program, I think, an option in EIS change that allow them to update them themselves, or they can go in manually and make changes. So um, those should be up to date. The 801 is the audit report. Um, this uh, tracks changes made in the EIS files. So at the end of the fiscal year, there is an official option um, that provides a more detail. There's a demand option, but the official option has a little more to it. And this is used as an official audit trail. So that's kind of part of our EIS CD as well. So again, they need to run EIS CD. Um, and it will generate all of these reports that we just talked about um, and have them out there. And also it's uh, recommended to make a copy of their EIS data at the end of the fiscal year, do a backup like you do with USAS. Um, and so these are the um, IDX files um, that are included in that. So all of the EIS.idx, there is an EIS.rel, a sequential file, Guess we don't need the EIS EMS anymore. I should have removed that. Um, um, and then also, it also includes some USAS files. So you can't run a lot of the programs in EIS without some of the USAS data. Um, so here's a, a list of the USAS files as well. Now, when they're ready to close, they're going to run the EIS close. So this is going to create a EIS close report, and that's going to include the ending balances and uh, the beginning. And it's going to advance EIS, um, the fiscal year flag, and show um, that it's going to update that by a year in that screen. 
and it's also going to create a year's worth of depreciation. So um, these are the things I don't know where right now um, the redesign is at regarding closing and what that's doing in regards to depreciation. I'm, I, I'm not sure where they're at with that, but that's something obviously that, um, that they're working on. Um, so once that's done then, um, EIS is complete and they can start entering in inventory uh, for the new year. So if for some reason their EIS gap flag is not turned on, um, the ITC, this is an ITC step. Um, so this is a SISMAN um, program and they need to make sure that um, their EIS gap flag is, is turned on. So EIS gap will do that. It's run only once and it's run at the beginning of the gap start up here. So this usually is involved when a district has a new inventory. Um, and uh, you know, for, your, for all your districts, they're already on EIS, nothing new. They already are, um, the gap flag's already set. So they're just going ahead and running EIS close and then moving on to the new year. This is more involved, like I said, when you have a new inventory and you're importing, you know, loading their new inventory, making sure everything's set and good to go before you actually turn the EIS gap flag on. So EIS gap will turn that flag into that screen to yes, and it will create those beginning balance fields. That's the most important part about EIS gap is it goes out there and sets those beginning in balance fields. So, you know, when you run a 103 report, those beginning balance column is coming from this. It's from those beginning balance fields that are stored in EIS item screen. So once the EIS gap is complete, then they can start entering their inventory. Um, so any questions regarding the classic program? I don't see anything in chat. What I'd like to talk about a little bit, I know I, I'm running over here, we were hoping to finish by 11, but I do wanna talk about redesign. Um, and since we're talking about inventory and, um, and we can discuss this next week too, but I just wanted to tell you where we're at right now. So obviously um, we've been you know, working with the developers and seeing the progress that they're making on the inventory application. This is totally separate. This is not part of USAS. It's gonna be a separate application. So AR was part of USAS. So that became a module in USAS R. Inventory is a separate application altogether. And so um, it's got a different look to it. Um, they're using a different version of Baden. So I think it's way cool. I think, um, um, how the screens look and how they're run. Um, so it's pretty neat. Um, but we're going to be doing a beta release July 16th. And we've been working with, with a focus group with about a handful of districts. And it's been nice because we've got different varieties of districts. We have traditional, we have um, a career center, um, we have an ESC. So they're all involved on the call and they've been giving us a lot of good feedback uh, regarding, you know, enhancements and things that were, you know, just feedback on what they used in classic. Um, so um, the beta is going to be available July 16th. Now we're not going to leave you guys high and dry on this. You know, we are going to have um, steps on how to migrate inventory from classic into the redesign. So we will have those migration pre-data extract steps post import steps, we're gonna have the documentation out there. We're gonna have all of that outlined. So to make this as a smooth transition as possible for you guys. Um, so the beta for those that are interested in, in trying it out earlier can do the beta release on July 16th, but the actual production release is going out August 16th. So our training with ITCs is scheduled for July 30th. And so this will be a training that I will be conducting to take you guys through inventory and show you everything. Um, it's gonna be a train the trainer um, session. It's going to be recorded and we're gonna be going through that as well as the pre-data extract, post import, stuff like that. So I really want like the pre-data stuff 
um, out ahead of time, way ahead before, of July 30th. So I'm hoping to have that stuff out within the next month um, so that you guys can get prepared for this. Um, we have been sending out, we did send out one email regarding this EISR, EXTR. So that was an SSDT notice that we sent out the end of April. And this is a program that needs to be run close to migration time. So you don't wanna run it now because what this is doing is it's capturing data from the EISDAT.REL file, which is their DAT screen information, fiscal year, capitalization thresholds. So um, we didn't have a way to get that stuff from the classic files. So that's why we're having you run this. Um, we're doing a UDMS extraction, um, I believe, of all of the classic data. And this one just was given us fits. Um, so we had to create a dot com procedure to get that information. So obviously you don't wanna run that now because if your districts are gonna close inventory in July, their fiscal year is gonna be 22, you know? So, um, and you've got a file right now for 21 that's not gonna match everything else. And so you wanna wait till it gets close to when you're ready to migrate them to run this. And like I said, it's capturing the DAT file information and it's gonna create a log file and it's gonna create an XML file. So that EIS underscore or IR number dot XML is the data that's going to be um, migrated. So, and it's just like I said, the EIS DAT screen um, information. So like I said, we're currently working on uh, testing the software. Um, so I've um, been working on that and um, playing around with it. And uh, while I'm doing that, I'm also documenting it. So we do have an inventory link, I think, sitting out there in the homepage of the wiki, but it's not available to anyone yet. So, um, so we're, we're adding the documentation as we go, providing screenshots. And, um, and like I said, so there will be a user guide. The, there will be a migration procedure. And so, you know, we've had a couple of questions. We've had some questions about the EIS, R, EXTR. We've also had questions about cleaning up. And uh, yeah, I mean, our recommendation is they need to be caught up on it. They should be caught up on inventory. But if they aren't, and let's say they're still in fiscal year 20 and you migrate them over, then they're gonna be in fiscal year 20 in redesign. You know, it doesn't have any bearing a connection with USAS, just like it didn't in classic. So, but, um, you know, I think that, you know, it's just a good recommendation that your districts get caught up with this and get their inventory in place and check before um, you start migrating them in the fall. So any questions about preparing for redesign? And we will keep in contact with you guys about this. When we start adding stuff out there, um, you know, we will, you know, let you know, uh, like when these pre-data steps will be out there and stuff like that. Um, and they're going to be constantly changing. I mean, this is new to me as well. So, you know, we are going to do our best to make sure that everything's out there and ready to go. And we are doing, you know, going to be doing test imports of like the uh, um, focus group. Um, they're allowing us to look at their data um, and uh, import their data. So we got, you know, actual district data here that we're importing into making sure that everything is um, importing in correctly. And so, like I said, all that information will be out there. I'm hoping to start getting stuff out there in another month, um, especially uh, the migration steps and getting that out there so you guys can see what's involved and that you're better prepared when um, this actually goes into a live release. Anything else? Okay, well, I'm gonna go ahead and end on that. Okay, well, um, if you guys don't have any further questions regarding classic, you know, Andrew and I appreciate 
um, you guys taking the time um, to go through this with us. And if you have any questions regarding the classic steps, you know, don't hesitate to create a classic support ticket. Um, and we can help you through navigate through fiscal year end. So you guys have a good uh, weekend, enjoy it. And uh, we'll talk to you guys soon. Thank you.